Hello, Noir Vortex here, and today I'm going to cover a somewhat controversial um, subject, um, given it's how much of a stir it's created in the uh, technology sector, and that is the um, Google manifesto that was released by a software engineer, I think, about last week. Um, so I'm going to just read parts of it and just give some thoughts, I guess, essentially. Um, at first, I didn't really, because I just skimmed through the article at first, I didn't really understand why it created such a stir, because I just skimmed through it. Very, and this is quite a long article, I managed to read all of it. Um, but having reread it a few times, I do understand now the reason why it has been, been the way it is. And they're kind of like some of the responses have been very good as well. Because, I mean, there is a. It's not like an all culture within technology, but there are certain, certainly certain um, sectors of whether it be in education or in actual working business, I think, where there are still glass ceilings in some respects. But anyway, that's my biases covered. I'm going to just go through this kind of point by point, I suppose, and just talk about it. So let's get it up. So, 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 right, okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm just going to read this, every part. This might be quite boring, but bear with me. So, I'm just going to read this from the top. Uh, response to public, uh, reply to public response and misrepresentation. Um, I value diversity and inclusion. I'm not denying that sexism exists and don't endorse using stereotypes. When addressing the gap in representation in the population, we need to look at population level differences and distributions. If we can't have an honest discussion about this, then we can never truly solve the problem. We can truly solve the problem. Psychological safety is built on mutual respect and acceptance, but unfortunately a culture of shaming and misrepresentation is disrespectful and unaccepting of anyone outside is echo jibber. Despite what the public response seems to have been, I've got many personal messages from fellow Googlers expressing their gratitude for bringing up these very important issues which they agree with but would never have the courage to say or defend because of our shaming culture and the possibility of being fired. This needs to change. So he seems to be saying that there's a, um, a culture, a monoculture essentially in Google. So we've not really gone on to gender yet. So this should be interesting. Well, I already know what the conclusions of the thing are which I don't particularly agree with. Um, so, anyway, go on. I'm not going to do the TLDR, I'm going to go straight into the main bit. Background 1. People generally have good intentions, we all have biases which are invisible to us. Thankfully, open and honest discussion with those who disagree can highlight our blind spots and help us grow. That's why I write this document. 2. Google has several biases and honest discussion about these biases is being silenced by the dominant ideology. I assume we can just cover that now. What follows is by no means a complete story. But it's a perspective that desperately needs to be told at Google. So, what does he think Google's biases are? At Google, we talk so much about unconscious bias as applies to race and gender, but we rarely discuss our moral biases. Political orientation is actually a result of deep moral preferences and thus biases. Considering the overwhelming majority of the social sciences, media, and Google lean left, we should critically examine these prejudices. He's going on to then describe from his perspective what a left bias is, um, compassion for the weak. Disparities are due to injustice. Humans inherited is curative, change is good, uh, open and idealist, right bias. Respect for the strong and authority, disparities are natural and just, humans inherently competitive, change is dangerous, closed and pragmatic. Um, now I'm just gonna, this is kind of nitpicking a bit, um, but he's being a very, very broad brush of these definitions of the moral, morality, um, within the left and the right. In the left and the right of broad churches. But, I'm not going to really critique that, it's obviously this massive article I've got loads to go through. Neither side is 100% correct, both viewpoints are necessary for a functioning society, or in this case, company. So it seems like he's advocating for this commonly um, position of like centrist, I guess. A company too far to the right may be slow to react, overly hierarchical and untrusting of others. In contrast, a company too far to the left will constantly be changing, deprecating much love services. Over diversify its interests, ignoring or being ashamed of its core business, and overly trust its employers and competitors. Only facts and reason can shed light on these biases. But when it comes to diversity and inclusion, Google's left bias has crept to create a politically correct monoculture that maintains its hold by shaming dissenters into silence. The silence removes any checks against encroaching extremist and authoritarian policies. 
The rest of the document will concentrate on the extreme stance that all differences in outcome are due to differential treatment. Um, and the authority and elements required to actually discriminate to create equal representation. So what's he saying here? I'll concentrate on the extreme stance that all. What? That only doesn't really make sense. I'll concentrate on the extreme stance that all differences in outcome are due to differential treatment. Uh, okay. Let's go on then. Possible non bias cause of the gender gap in tech. Google were really regularly told that implicit, unconscious, and explicit bases are holding women back in tech and leadership. And this is the real meat of it, really. Of course, men and women experience bias, tech, and the workplace differently. We should be um, cognizant of this, but it's far from the whole story. On average, men and women. Biologically, this is where he's got a lot of criticism as well, and pretty much like, to be honest, this bit is worthy of criticism, from what I remember. Biologically different in many ways, these differences aren't just socially constructed because they're universal across human culture, they often have clear biological cause and links to prenatal testosterone. Biological males, males that were castrated at birth and raised a female often still identify and act like males. The underlying tra traits are highly heritable. They're exactly what we would predict from an evolutionary psychology perspective. Um, and I'll just let's talk about what I actually believe. So, I mean, I agree that I don't think um, gender is entirely socially constructed. I think there is definitely a hormonal basis for some, you know, in terms of like how many, how many Eastern or testosterone males and females have respectively will affect um, their perceived masculinity or femininity I suppose um, and then, but I'm about to probably I think go on to a really controversial part of this um, which I definitely don't agree with I mean I think there is a degree of social construction to gender but it's just, I mean I, I think it's as simple as being a mix of an environment and a bit of biology as well but what relevance that has to how well someone can code is very extremely tenuous but anyway no i'm just saying that all men differ from women in the following ways that these differences are just i'm simply stating that distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ in due part to biological according yeah. uh, biological causes and that these differences may explain why we don't see equal representation of women in tech and leadership Many of these differences are small, and there's a significant overlap between men and women, so you can't say anything about an individual given these population differences. So that's kind of a contradiction you can see already. Many of these differences are small. So you're saying that the differences are small, so where, why therefore is he made, using his argument being that those differences to therefore explain why there's... If the differences are small, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't have as large an effect as it does like on the entire population of tech workers. But anyway, go on. So this is the bit where it gets really kind of controversial, I guess, because he's kind of, he's trying to justify reasons for why there aren't as many women in IT by using a lot of kind of cliched thinking. But I don't want to go into it with too pretty much judgment, even though I've read this once or twice now. Women on, personal image, women on average have more openness directed towards feelings and aesthetics rather than ideas. Women generally also have a stronger interest in people rather than things relative to men. Also interpreted as empathizing versus systemizing. These two differences in part explain why women relatively prefer jobs in social artistic areas. While men may like coding because it requires systemizing and even within SWEs, comparatively more women work on front end, which deals with both people and aesthetics. Um that's a good question that straight away. Front end, I'm assuming it means front end development, front, front end web development. Um, yeah, obviously you have to deal with people, obviously you have to deal with the design, but you're still coding in fucking front end. I mean, what? Like, you still, you still, you can, you still at least have to write good HTML and CSS, JavaScript probably as well, jQuery, probably using Node, or like even WordPress development as well. It's still, you're still coding in that. It's still very much a, yeah, sure, it's not really advanced back end development, but. I don't understand really what his point is there. Uh, extroversion expresses gregariousness rather than assertiveness. Also, higher agreeableness. 
sorry, agreeableness. Agree, agreeableness. Sorry, I completely fucked up. This leads to women generally having a harder time negotiating salary, asking for raises, speaking up and leading. Note that these are just average differences and there's no over, uh, there's overlap between men and women, but this is seen solely as a women's issue. This leads to exclusionary programs like stretch and swathes of men without support. Neuroticism, higher anxiety, lower stress tolerance. This may con contribute to higher levels of anxiety women report on Google guides into the lower number of women in high stress jobs. So he's making a very s broad, 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 kind of very stereotypical assumptions about gender there, which are very, like, you know, basically what he's saying is when men are logical, women are feeling orientated. Uh, the neuroticism thing is just incredibly generalistic. <laughs> So saying that women deal with stress less well, which is again, I mean, I'm gonna, I can't remember exactly what he did to try and back this up, but let's have a look. No, the contrary to what a social constructivist would argue, research suggests that greater nation level gender equality leads to psychological dissimilarity in men and women's personality traits, because as society becomes more prosperous and more egalitarian, innate dispositional differences between men and women have more space to develop, and the gap that exists between men and women in their personality becomes wider. We need to stop assuming that gender gaps imply sexism. Well, that's kind of an interesting point in some respects, and I've actually heard this, uh, I think it was Jordan Peterson who's very popular on the YouTube. Uh, he does actually say some quite interesting, I don't necessarily agree with a lot of what he said, he got in, uh, a lot of shit in Canada for the pronoun issue, which was actually quite nuanced and I'm really not going to take sides on that one. Uh, I don't think he was right to like make it as big an issue of it, but to be fair, it kind of seems like he was quite ostracised unfairly by the academic community. But regardless of that, uh, what's the real crux of this? Gender, cap gender gaps imply sexism, and I guess he's doing that based on the Jordan Peterson uh, videos, probably his own research as well. But um, and they are sure there's some anecdotal evidence for that. But let's just see what he used to justify his arguments and his massive assumptions above. Men's higher drive for success, right, which is a cliche. Sort of. We always ask why we don't need women in top leadership positions, but we never ask why so many men, why we see so many men in these jobs. These positions often require long, stressful hours that may not be worth it for a balanced and fulfilling life. Status is the primary metric that men are judged on for basic purposes, pushing many men into those higher paying, less satisfying jobs for the status they entail. Note the same forces that lead men into high pay, high stress jobs in tech and leadership cause men to make undesirable, take undesirable and dangerous jobs like coal mining, garbage uh, collection and firefighting and suffer 93% of work related deaths. Uh, so he's saying that men in general have a higher, well yeah, I mean I guess in general yeah, men have a higher risk behaviour or risk, they're, not, they're less risk averse, that's probably true as a general thing but I mean what he's probably forgetting is men are also generally physically stronger and just like we have a different distribution of muscle like you know muscle distribution different we just physically may live less time in general because we're fueled by testosterone which just kills us faster but regardless of that i mean he's talking about if he's talking about tech leadership like how is that really related to doing dangerous jobs leadership's about in tech is about um, being communicative, uh, receptive, um, keeping up innovative. It's about a whole host of personality factors. It's not really about, it's not as much in the tech sector about being the best. I mean, it, it, your business wants to be the best, but in terms of in your team, it's actually about a lot of co-working and stuff. So I don't see, how is that not positive then, if anything, to have that kind of, if he's assuming that those, you know, cooperation, increased cooperation of feminine traits, um, why isn't that a good thing? Anyway, non-discriminatory ways to reduce the gender gap. So this might be quite interesting. Below I'll go over some of the differences in distribution of traits between men and women that I outlined in the previous section and suggest ways to address them to increase women's representation in tech and without resorting to discrimination. Google is already making strides in many of these areas, but I think it's still instructive to list them. Women in average show a high interest in people and men in things. Quite a generalization, but Maybe it's true, I don't know. We can make software engineering more people orientated with pair programming and more collaboration. Unfortunately, there may be limits to how people orientated to certain roles in Google can be, and we shouldn't deceive ourselves as students are thinking otherwise. Some of our programs to get female students into coding might be 
doing this? What was we coming to? Run will average a more cooperative. I really don't know to be honest on that. I think we I mean, were just based on anecdotal. Women and men are can be cooperative, it just depends on circumstance a lot of the time. But I probably haven't got time to dive into that, I could go through a lot. Although there's exhibiting cooperative behaviour to thrive. Recent updates to Perth, maybe doing this to an extent, but maybe there's more that we can do. This doesn't mean that we should remove all competitiveness from Google. Competitiveness and self-reliance can be valuable traits and we shouldn't necessarily disadvantage those that have them. Like be what's been done in education. We should probably expand on that. Women on average are more prone to anxiety. Make tech and leadership less stressful. Google already partly does this with its many stress reduction courses and benefits. Uh, again, he's doing. He's, going, he's kind of reverting to this really silly, like hysterical women argument, which is quite ridiculous. Women, on average, look for more work-life balance, while men have a higher drive for status. On average, uh, well, that probably has to do with family rearing and stuff. If women choose to have children, um, I guess that's probably correct. But yeah, I mean, unfortunately, as long as tech and leadership remain high status, lucrative careers, men may. Disproportionately, disproportionately want to be in them. Allowing and truly endorsing as part of a culture of part time work, though, can keep women in tell us a bit um, patronizing, I've got to say. The male gender role is currently inflexible. Hey, I can't remember reading this bit. The male gender role is currently inflexible. Does he mean in terms of how men are supposed to be men? I'm uh, kind of like a bit. I'm not sure what it means by that. Feminism has made great progress in freeing women from the female gender role, but men are still very much tied to the male gender role. Uh, if we as a society allow men to become more feminine, then the gender gap will shrink, though probably because men will leave tech and leadership for traditionally feminine roles. So I guess he's bringing up, a f he's assuming that feminism creates feminine men. I don't really agree with that, to be honest. It depends how you define these terms, obviously, but I mean, as you know, like I, I'd consider myself a feminist, but purely just because I believe in equality and you know, women having the right to their own uh, person, you know, their individuality and their own expression of their own femininity, does that then create make me more feminine? Hell no! It just means that I listen sometimes, and I actually have to be more receptive sometimes to women's issues. Um, and a lot of the times, to be honest, and like I'm, I'm not perfect as a feminist, I've like I fumbled through a lot of things, and um, but I mean, essentially for me, what it breaks down to is listening more, which isn't a feminine is it isn't a feminine attribute. It's just being communicative. Anyway, philosophically, I don't think we should do arbitrary social engineering with tech just to make it ap equal, appealing to equal portions of both men and women. For each of these changes, we need principles, reasons for why it helps Google. That is, we should be optimising for Google. With Google's diversity being a component of that, for example, those trying to work extra hours and take extra stress will inevitably get ahead. And if you try to change that too much, it may have disastrous consequences. <coughs> uh, also, when considering the costs and benefits, we should keep in mind that Google's funding is finite, so its allocation is more zero sum than its genuine knowledge. So he's saying that we shouldn't have incentives for women to get into tech. Well, I just fundamentally disagree with this. If there's a gap, then resource should be put into just figuring out why that's there. Not all the resource, not even the maximum of it, but there should be some kind of like at least, at least analysis and just even if it's just surveying women in working it, like it's just then you can identify issues and then if there are issues, you can sort them out. I mean, that's just, it's, surely that's just like good business 101. Anyway, harm of Google's biases. I strongly believe in gender and racial diversity. And I think we should strive for more. However, to achieve a greater equal and race representation, Google has created several discriminatory practices. This might be quite interesting. Programs mentoring in classes only for people with certain gender or race. A high priority career and special treatment for diversity candidates. 
Um, I mean that's uh, hiring practices which can effectively lower the bar for diversity. Candidates by decreasing the false negative rate. We're considering any set of people if it's not diverse enough, but not showing that the same scrutiny in the reverse direction. Clear confirmation bias. Setting org levels OKRs, OKRs for increased representation, which can incentivize legal discrimination. So this is all very Google specific. These practices are based on false assumptions generated by our biases and can actually increase race and gender tensions. We're told by senior leadership that what we're doing is both morally and economically correct things to do. Without evidence, this has just failed left ideology that can irre irreparably damage go harm Google. So this is kind of interesting, and this is very complicated territory to get into. But uh, and I don't know all the details, obviously. I mean, this this seems counterproductive to me. I'll agree with him on that. Programs are entering classes only for people of a certain gender or race. That seems to me, on you know, honestly, kind of counterproductive. And it, it's literally creating ghettos in the company, so I'd agree with them that. Uh, again, that's wrong. It should just be based on purely ability. So, it, uh, I mean, on terms of like this, he's got some good points here. Um, that's a bit of a dodgy point. I don't really know to talk about that. Uh, so, why we're blind. We all have biases and use motivated reasoning to dismiss ideas that run counter to our internal values. Just as some of the right deny science that runs counter to the god as humans environment hierarchy, e.g. evolution and climate change, the left tends to deny science concerning biological differences between people, e.g. IQ and sex differences. Not all the left, actually, frankly. But yeah, this is so there's kind of like identity politics left. Uh, this is also that's bullshit. Um, that's grey, more grey. It's, like, it's more complicated. That's absolute bollocks. I mean, IQ, even as a, a measure of intelligence, is not perfect, as a, probably people will be aware. It's not the only measure of intelligence. And it's, I don't know, it's just. I know from what I've read in the research before, there's some research that suggests that women as like a mass actually have uh, in general like as a, as a generalization have a higher level of general intelligence whereas with men is more disparity but you have like so you've got more high higher you've got like a few very very high a few very very low and then everyone's kind of like without the medium level of intelligence for men is more, less than women but then extraordinarily high iqs Care more than men or something like that, but like as a general term, I just uh, I mean that's a really complicated cause. I can't go into it too much. But thankfully, climate change and evil biologists generally aren't on the right. Unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of humanity is the social scientists lean left, about 95%, which creates enormous bias, confirmation bias. Change what's, what's being studied, maintain myths like social constructionism. constructionism and the gender wage gap. Google's left leaning makes it blind to the bias and uncritical of its results, which we are using to justify highly politicized programs. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm sure social constructivism, I think, is quite flawed in some respects, and I think it's it's very, it's too ideologically um, driven, I suppose, in some respects, but there's some aspects of social construction, I think, in identity, in truth. Uh, I think culture has a play to be part as well. Gender wage gap, that is, it depends, it's a complicated issue, it depends where, what, uh, it depends mostly on, I don't, sometimes I think it's overemphasized, if I'm honest, it's gender wage gap, but it is an issue, so it does need to be addressed. Whether that means, you know, having these kind of splinter groups, which I think is probably not a good idea, but, uh, in addition to the left, let's carry on, in addition to the left's affinity for those who who it seems is weak. Humans are generally biased towards pr protecting females. Uh, as mentioned before, this likely evolved because males are biologically disposable. <laughs> because, because women are generally more cooperative and agreeable than men. Agreeable, some of the spell mistakes. We have extensive government and Google programs fields to study illegal and social norms to protect women. When a man complains about a gender issue affecting men, he's labelled as a misogynist and a whiner. Um, not really. Well, obviously, I know there are corners of the net or in real life where if, man, if a man talks 
openly about an issue that's affecting him and which is exclusive to men, then he may get mocked, but often that's online. I mean, that's online isn't really a real representation of actual communication. And, I mean, let's not pretend as guys that if a woman brings up issues, she's often not like reduced down to you know, being mocked or whatever. Uh, I mean, often with gender politics, it can get really nasty on both sides where you get like the extreme kind of femi feminists going on and making extremely reductive feministic comments about all men and uh, on the flip side you get like the kind of extreme end of like the manosphere I suppose what they call a manosphere it shouldn't just be like as soon as anything's labeled feminist that's all I'm actually bad so Nearly every, nearly every, I mean, I like to be fair on the misogynist and whiner thing. I mean, I've been incorrectly labelled a misogynist once. I'm not going to go into the details. And I definitely wasn't being misogynist. It was just a very offhand comment by someone. Uh, a woman. But, and she was completely wrong. So, anyway, and you just gotta like, sometimes you just gotta let that stuff go over your head. Nearly every difference between men and women is interpreted as a form of women's oppression. As for many other things in life, gender differences are often a case of grasping on the other side. Unfortunately, taxpayer and Google men money is spent to water only one side of the law. What, what are you suggesting is an alternative? Is just like, are men struggling in the tax sector? No. So, if, if someone's. If, one, if half the world's population is struggling to get into the tax sector for whatever reason, it actually makes sense to invest a bit in that and see if there are problems. I mean, that's, that's just common sense. The same compassion for those seen as weak creates political correctness, which can, which can sustain constrains discourse and is complacent to the extremely sensitive PC authoritarians who use violence and shaming to advance their cause. While Google hasn't harboured the violent leftist protests that we're seeing at universities, the frequent shaming in TGIF and in our cultures create the same silent, psychologically unsafe environment. Now, this is quite a okay, fraught issue. Political correctness is like to at least as in one of his um, stand-up routines, it's an often clumsy way of trying, of like a kind of institutionalised politeness, I think he says in one of his stand-up routines. And at its best, that's kind of what I see it is. I mean, I can understand that sometimes it can go really a bit silly. But, I mean, extremely sensitive PC authoritarians. And I guess he's relating this to the uh, a lot of the uh, riots that have occurred in America. I mean, I kind of get the impression that this man is uh, probably been keeping a lot of track of Milo Yiannopoulos, Jordan Peterson, all these kind of immediate figures. I mean, I've got a bit of time for Jordan Peterson, in all fairness. He has to say some very interesting things. He's an interesting thinker. Milo, I've got no time for, to be honest. I, I've actually watched a lot of what he said, and I mean, I'm a, I'm a socialist. I'm a left-leaning person, admittedly. Um, but... Milo, I just have to talk. Anyway, I'm going for a tangent. Uh, okay, suggestions. Sorry, this is this is taking ages. I hope it's clear that I'm not saying that diversity is bad, that Google or society is 100% fair, that we shouldn't try to correct for existing biases, or that minorities have the same experiences of those in the majority. My larger points are even intolerance for ideas and evidence that don't fit a certain ideology. I'm not saying that we should restrict people to certain gender roles, and we're advocating for quite the opposite. Treat people as individuals, not as just another member of their group, travelers. That's kind of, um, that makes sense in a way, but again, he's like, yeah, he's kind of doing this thing where he's making loads of generalizations, which are going to put off a lot of women at the end of the day, you know, saying that you're not suited to this or whatever. And that's just not, it's not helpful. I mean, he should have obviously the right to say it. I don't think in truth he should have been fired for his opinions. If I can just say that, I don't think it's right that he's lost his job because of this. I mean, essentially, he's, I don't think his opinion is very well founded or his, um, or well researched particularly, but that he's been fired certainly is, I think, unfair. But, anyway, so what's concrete solutions are? <laughs> Demoralise diversity. As soon as you start to moralise an issue, we stop thinking about it in terms of costs and benefits. Dismiss anyone that agrees, disagrees is moral and harshly punish those who see as villains to protect the victims. 
Uh, well, really, that just depends on um, if you've got a minority in a company and they are getting marginalised, attacked in the extreme. Um, that is immoral. It just depends on context. That's really a context question. Stop alienating conservative. Viewpoint diversity is arguably the most important type of diversity in political orientation. It's one of the most fundamental and significant ways in which people view things differently. In highly progressive environments, conservatives and minority feel that they need to stay in the closet to avoid open hostility. We should empower those with different ideologies to be able to express themselves. Alienating conservatives, both non inclusive and generally bad business. Because conservatives tend to be higher in conscientiousness, which is required, required for much of the drudgery and maintenance for a characteristic of mature company. Um, well, I mean, this is polit politics really, in the ideal, shouldn't really dominate in a, in a workplace. Whether you're left libertarian, right libertarian, socialist, whether you're a democrat, whether you're a republican, whether you're, the, whether you're an anarchist, whether you're whatever, whether you're a communist, whether you're bloody you know, right, right wing nationalist, whatever. I don't like those times, but anyway, that's my bias. Um, confront Google's biases before it's even. I've mostly concentrated on how biases cloud our thinking about diversity and inclusion, but our moral biases are far more reaching than that. I will start by breaking down Google guides to scores by political orientation and personality with fuller pitch into how big biases are affecting our culture. Uh, stop restricting programs and classes to certain genders and races. These discriminating approaches are both unfair and just have ice instead of focusing on some non discriminating practices or outlets. So I actually agree with that. I actually think that is quite it's a bad idea and kind of ghettoises the culture, which is not good. So that's one point I agree with. Have an open and honest discussion about the costs and benefits of our diversity programs. This is, again, I don't think I agree with this because I think if there is a problem, or if there's a perceived problem, and if people are saying there's a problem, or if people want more work done, Google are a multi billion, multi, multi, multi billion corporation. They can afford to invest in that. I'm not content. Discriminating just to increase the selection of a decimal. Discriminating just to increase the representation of women in tech. This is misguided bias to mandate increases for women's representation in the homeless, work related to violent deaths, prisons, and school dropouts. There's currently very little transparency into the extent, extent, extent of our diversity programs which keep it immune to criticism from those outside its ideological echo chamber. These programs are highly politicised, which further alienates non progressive. I realise that some of our programs may be precautioned against government accusations of discrimination, but this can easily backfire since they incentivise legal discrimination. Um, it sounds to me like it's just a cultural thing that Google are trying to do to. Uh, as long as they're not, well, yeah, I mean, positive discrimination is it's not cool either. It should be purely based on ability, but. At the same time, he seems to be just saying cut the money to these programs that are trying to help uh, well, for women or minorities, whatever, whatever you want to call who he thinks is, is a minority in this company. Um, that's, that's a good thing. I mean, like, if Google can afford this, you know, focus on psychological safety, not just race, gender, diversity. We should focus on psychological safety, which has shown positive effects. And should hopefully not lead to unfair discrimination. That's a pretty good sort of point. We need psychological safety and shared values to gain the benefits of diversity. Uh, having representative viewpoints is important for those designing and testing products. The, te the benefits are less clear for those more removed from uh, user interface design. Uh, user experience, sorry. Um, well, yeah, that's a good thing. DEM fires empathy. Uh, I've heard several calls for increased empathy on diversity issues. While I strongly support trying to understand how and why people think the way they do, relying on effective empathy, feeling another's pain, causes us to focus on anecdotes, favour individuals similar to us, and harbour of irrational, dangerous biases. Being emotionally engaged helps us better reason about the facts. Um, is that possible? I would say. Be emo completely emotionally engaged from every single issue, especially when it comes to swingers like diversity. I question whether that's actually possible, unless you're a complete 
robot. Emotional, even if, like, I'm not a particularly emotional person, but I do get emotional, obviously, over some things. So, I just, I, yeah, nice, nice ideal, but whether that can actually be put into practice without it going completely wrong and just backfiring in terms of creating a monoculture in its own way, I'd argue that's probably what we'll do in actual practice. Prioritise intention. I'll focus on my questions and other in unintentional transgressions. Increases our sensitivity, which is not universally positive. Sensitivity increases both our tendency to take offence and our self censorship, leading to authoritarian policies. Speaking up without the fear of being harshly judged is essential to psychological safety, but these practices can remove the, that safety by judging unintentional transgression. Microaggression, training incorrectly and dangerously equates speech with violence and isn't battle violence. Now, this is quite an interesting one because I kind of agree with the point about microaggressions. I think. Uh, if, you, if you are in an environment where, well, in context anyway, if you're in an environment where part of the environment, the job work environment is to uh, discuss ideas, then if someone's constantly accusing you of microaggressions, that would get pretty annoying. I, I understand that. Um, where it gets actual aggressions, however, on the other hand, need to be dealt with in any organisations. Microaggressions is, is a concept I think is deeply flawed, but and it's, in, it's, it's absolutely 100% it's interpretive. It's not really, it's kind of a bullshit idea, and I kind of agree with that, I suppose. Not with the whole thrust of what he's saying, but just the microaggressions. So, be open about the science and human nature. Oh, this is going to be dodgy then. Once you acknowledge that all differences are socially constructed or due to discrimination, we open our eyes to a more accurate view of the human condition, which is necessary if we actually want to solve problems. Some of that I agree with, it's worded very clumsily, uh, and again, I don't really agree with the conclusions. Uh, sure, there is, it's not all socially constructed. Um, some stuff, you know, discrimination, and we obviously have anti-discrimination legislation in companies, and well, just like, just for that not to happen. But anyway, I'm going to reconsider making unconscious bias training mandatory for preferring mode committees. We haven't been able to measure any effects of our unconscious bias training and it has the potential for over correcting all backlash, especially if made mandatory. So the suggested methods of the current training are likely to be useful, but the political bias of the presentation is free for the factual examples and actually thinking we should. Spend more time on the other types of biases besides stereotypes. Stereotypes are much more accurate and responsive to new information than the training suggests. I'm not advocating for using stereotypes, I am just pointing out, I, just pointing out the, <laughs> I'm, I'm point, just pointing out the factual inaccuracy of what's said in the training. Uh, okay, so this is the end of it. Blah, 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 the document is mostly, oh, this is just the notes. So, so you've got a few notes here as well. Stuff about communism against uh, as opposed to capitalism, which really, I guess, has a sort of relationship here, but it's kind of a more political question. Uh, the IQ test were initially championed by the left-wing meritocracy, meant to help the bits of the aristocracy. Just a sizzle. So that's just a statement. So that's all of it. Uh, so I've gone through everything there, pretty much. Just get my face in here now. So, so, if you made it to the end of this, uh, well done. Basically, there's a few very, very minor points in this which I think are kind of interesting about the microaggressions, uh, about the culture in Google, but in general, it's very, 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 very generalistic very non backed up by much contemporary evidence as far as I can tell in terms of uh, the reasons why uh, not as many women seem to be in tech and yeah I mean like all I've, in my opinion all that really matters is that I don't think we should necessarily strive for a place where we've got 50 50 percent 50 50 split um, dev team and all that stuff because that seems that is indeed um, silly. We should strive for that kind of thing in, like in general. We shouldn't um, 
but I think women will, women will, this will be a long change. This will take a long time for it to happen. And it probably does require some kind of culture change in IT. And actually the competitive points you kept on making about comp competition, competition, competition. This is a lot of the stuff that actually drives women away from IT, I guess. And like having studied computer science and worked in, most, actually most of the people I work with are really, really sound dudes, really. And most of the dudes as well, not always. But also um, that kind of personality yeah, sometimes at its worst happens in IT of I am right and kind of like rubbing up people like or like taking piss out of people if they don't have, have a certain form of extremely niche knowledge is just toxic in IT. Really, really toxic. A really toxic attitude to have in general. It's like if if you went to a job and someone is just like really a bit of a know-it-all but didn't want to share their knowledge, that's not what a good coder is. A good coder will gladly share their knowledge and point people in the right direction. And yeah, in general, this article just takes an extremely, really old-fashioned view of like male-female difference and it's, it's just not useful. There's been some interesting responses. To this video, which I'll I might talk about in another video, because this is going to be obviously it's quite long. I've gone through it in a lot of detail, but it's the kind of thing you need to go through with like a, a tooth comb and really sit down and just do sort of done that because I think that's just useful to do, and it doesn't really leave any gaps in terms of what my view and position on this thing is. And uh, I mean, at first I was quite confused by this. And in some, like I think when I first posted up, I said I agreed to the microaggression point. Um, and there was one point I kind of pick, picked up on which I agreed with, which is about, I mean, I kind of agree with the general notion that it shouldn't really matter what gender the person is. You should just hire the person who's best qualified for the job, which is true. But where he's wrong on this article is saying, well, we shouldn't make special provision to try and get women in bottom minorities involved in coding. But I think we really should, to be honest. And it's not because they need help, it's just because they need, if there are barriers to access, we need to identify what those are and uh, eliminate those barriers. Simple as that. And Google, big tech companies, like biggest corporations in the world, they can afford to do this stuff. Uh, his point on the actual the splintering off, and I really did agree with that point actually in truth. I think it's a very unuseful thing to split groups into special interest groups. So like I said, I'm not being completely attack on this thing. Um, I'm not being completely like attacking on the article itself. I think it's general, the major flaw of this thing is generalization, too much generalization of uh, women in IT. And that is just that any other serious point that could have been made in the entire article is diluted because of that. And obviously he's becoming a bit of a martyr now for, I mean, people are saying this thing called alt-right. I don't really know, I'm not really up to date with it. Uh, alt-right has kind of been diluted down as a, as a phrase now. But without further ado, I'll end this video here. I think I've covered quite a lot actually. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any thoughts of your own, just leave them below. I'll, I like to hear, uh, any opinion, whether it be critical or otherwise. Did you, did you find the article interesting? Did you agree with it? Did you hate it? Do you, have you seen any very interesting counter uh, articles that refute a lot of what he says? Uh, anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, no awful text.